All right, I think we're gonna to transition to hearing from some of those who have been instrumental in ESNet's history. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Ben Brown. Dr. Brown is the Director of the Facilities Division for DOE's Office of Science Advanced Scientific Computing Research or OSCAR program. A physicist by training, I'm surrounded by physicists, that's okay. Um, his research focused on optical control of quantum systems and quantum information science. As the, the director of, this, of the scientific uh, and the facilities division within OSCAR, Ben leads the strategic planning, budget formulation, and operational oversight of OSCAR's strategic national resources, including ESNet. Prior to this role, he served specifically as ESNet's program manager and has been key to the development and execution of the ESNet 6 project. With that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Ben Brown. Thank you. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here, and it's an extraordinary privilege to follow this morning's speakers and to see so many familiar faces, many of whom we haven't seen, I haven't seen in person in literally years. Um, this is obviously a moment of profound pride for the department. It's also a privilege, and with humility, I represent many people from Washington and from our site offices around the complex that have contributed to the success of ESNet. I want to begin by specifically heralding and celebrating the career of my boss, Barbara Helland, who has announced her impending retirement. She's been a stalwart supporter of ESNet and Berkeley Lab and her mentorship and guidance through the process of ESNet 6 and my career in the Office of Science has been uh, significant to me and I think to the ESNet enterprise. So this is a time for celebration. This is a time for reflection. So if you allow me uh, to take a moment to get a little meta, uh, there are several truths that I have come to know in my 14 years in the department, but it have been really honed and refined in the extraordinary privilege of the last several years being in the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research and working very closely with our partners here at the lab and the Berkeley site office. So, well, number one is that it's really important to celebrate and reflect. And I'm so proud that the team here has put this event on. I know it's an extraordinary amount of work. I was talking to some on the way in, it feels a bit like a wedding. Um, and, uh, or some sort of, you know, significant uh, sort of event, of, of a rite of passage. And I think that that is absolutely a truth of the moment. I wanna underscore that this moment is also about celebrating all who came before this moment. And the ESNet team is one that has been 35 years of people dedicating their careers to something bigger than one lab, one science, uh, one column. And that leads me to another deep truth that I've arrived at and being really a close student of our, you've heard about these user facilities in DOE, they're very peculiar beasts. I mean, these are really exquisite, very expensive, one of a kind resources that thousands of researchers around the country and the world depend on um, and expands their imagination about what might be possible to advance scientific discovery. And one of these deep truths that I've arrived at in my career at DOE uh, and as a public servant is that infrastructure is people. I know that may sound cliche, but we're in an era of renewal. We have the bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year. We are at a moment in which, uh, of course, there's deep division in the country. But when we reflect on the things that make our country great um, over its entire history, and in this moment, uh, I think about the people here at Berkeley Lab and at ESNet and NERSC and ALCF and OLCF at Oak Ridge and Argonne that I work with every day and the team at headquarters and the deep partnerships on which depend uh, the, the progress that we make. And when we think about infrastructure as people, it's about careers. It's really about people making a choice to, to stick with it, to, to be committed to a calling and the collegiality and partnership. It, and I see that ESNet absolutely and very viscerally is something extraordinary that totally, and this is another truth, reflects our culture and our values. And so I'd like to... Uh, conclude my remarks by going extraordinarily meta and thinking about the history of this laboratory. And it's just profound to be here with leaders of the lab today and some before, and those maybe in the future, in your future career paths. When we think of the history of the Department of Energy, and I give a, an orientation to new employees and new fellows in the department every year, and it causes me to take a step back and reflect, look at the slides, dust them off, think about how can I make this fresh? But one thing that I come back to again and again and again is that the Department of Energy began because of a war 
because of the extraordinary existential moment of, of Pearl Harbor and World War II, but the choice to create a civilian enterprise from that in the Atomic Energy Commission in the dawn of the nuclear age, and to consciously work to advance science for peaceful purposes and broad societal benefit are foundational to who we are in the Department of Energy. And the second component of that is that, of course, we've built up the lab infrastructure just here on this place, E.O. Lawrence, and this grand experiment of teams that needed not just the celebrated best and the brightest, but the best technicians, the best engineers, the best electricians, the best plumbers to come together and build the tools that could advance science. That is what the Department of Energy is all about. That is what our country is all about. That infrastructure that was built in the Cold War era was sort of the private purview of the, of the government for quite a long while. If you wanted to use it, you had to know someone. And I've reflected many years uh, with my former boss, Pat Damer, who's been an extraordinary mentor to me in my career, that it is not a given that what we have today is an open laboratory system where the campuses are open and that the advancement of science depends critically on inviting people to throw their ideas forward, to take a risk, and to be able to use this open infrastructure to advance their goals for higher purposes. And so when I reflect on this moment of ESnet 6 and its promise and what it means and what you've heard this morning from two incredible speakers with incredible technical depth, what it means to me is that the future is about a culture of even greater interconnectedness, of even greater openness of the national laboratories continuing to be bonded even closer together in offering what they have to be more than the sum of their parts to advance science for the greater good for our country and the world. So with that, I conclude my remarks with the deepest appreciation and humility for what you've achieved and my extraordinary pride in so many of you and what you've contributed to this country. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Carter. I'm the ALD for Computing Sciences. I want to add my welcome to that of Carol Burns, uh, to all our guests from the federal, state, and local government, our colleagues from other national labs, universities, and of course, Berkeley Lab staff. So first off, I want to congratulate the ESnet staff, both the project team, the organization as a whole, the management, um, for doing such a wonderful job here. I know there've been many, many challenges, particularly over the past two and a half years. And I think you've done a really wonderful job. I don't want to forget, I also want to call out the operations staff at this lab for helping out in this project too. There are many complicated procurements, upgrades of, of engineering that all had to be completed too. I also want to thank the DOE staff at headquarters and at the site office um, on, on really coming together, uh, as, as Ben mentioned, to make this, um, this a reality. Um, Berkeley Lab in the computing sciences area is, is the home of ESnet, and we focused on supporting ESnet as it's grown its capabilities over the past years uh, to become the, the DOE user facility that it has um, today. Um, in turn, ESnet is central in um, the CS area strategy, uh, one component of it called super facility which um, actually is very similar to the, uh, to the, um, the ideas that both uh, Ian and, and Ben described, that is providing a seamless connection between HPC computing resources, between sensors, between experimental facilities, so that the person using all these facilities together doesn't have to sweat the details about where the data is, where it has to go, how to get the best results the most quickly. Uh, and an example, uh, which is, um, happened during the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, connected with the Exascale uh, XFL project was um, services provided connecting the, the um, LCRS2 at Stanford uh, and moving that data to NERS for rapid processing and a, and a, a fast iteration loop of, of that. And there was just a taste of things uh, that will be, uh, be coming. And, and that's not all. Uh, ESnet has had a very innovative history uh, through, say, its science uh, DMZ uh, program. It's provided uh, labs and facilities and connection points, a roadmap to provide more seamless data transfers uh, to avoid um, security uh, where it's not required and, and generally accelerate the flow. 
In the area of network research, ESNet staff with partners are constantly developing new networking concepts that we think will become our operational services in the years to come. Things like in-network caching for improving uh, scientific throughput by taking a data set that might be very remote and caching it somewhere on the, on the network for, for fast uh, retrieval. They're also using artificial intelligence and machine learning for networking, applying techniques to optimize the current network infrastructure, to route large science flows in the most optimal way, to provide guaranteed transfers, and, and so on and so forth. They're also providing prototypes like the test deployment of a private 5G network in a watershed in Colorado State, which enables scientists to pull up data from sensors that might be floating in the watershed and take them back over the network for, um, for data processing. Right, I'll cut to the chase. Now for the ESNet 6 presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Inda Monga. Inda is the Division Director of the Scientific Networking Division. He's the Executive Director of ESNet. He's, he came to the lab with over 20 years of data and networking research experience, and he's, less, he's led ESNet, pardon me, for the last six years. He's very well known in the DOE and NSF research communities um, for his work in QuantNet and NSF's Fabric uh, project. And of course, he's responsible for driving the vision for ESNet 6 and also its, its execution. So, Inda, stage is yours. Thank you, everyone. What an amazing set of talks today uh, from Representative Lee, Senator uh, Alex Padilla, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Berhe, uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Foster, Vin Cerf. So thank you so much for all being here. I know you have traveled great distances to be here. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the story of the ESNet. Uh, talk about how science uses the network, give a little brief history on the upgrades, and then talk about the capabilities of ESNet 6. But before I do that, I want to showcase a video, and there's a lot more that can be said by a small video than by words. So please join me in viewing this video, and then I will start my presentation. Science begins as a conversation, a question, theory, which sparks discussion, debate, experimentation, collaboration. This is the language of discovery. For a long time, those scientific conversations were limited by the speed of horseback, the telephone, Mr. Watson, please come here, the modem. Today, we are experiencing an explosion in communications, conversations, connections, creating a world where data becomes discovery. No individual is alone responsible for a single stepping stone along the path of progress. Today, ESNet's international network makes the path of progress faster than ever. Scientists can collaborate side by side while thousands of miles apart. Exabytes of data speed across time zones with the power of ESNet, a global laboratory. ESNet connects great minds to make radical breakthroughs that will change everything. Science is a conversation, a global conversation, at the speed of ESNet. Thank you, everyone. So ESNet is a unique network, as you have heard from many speakers. It's a mission network. And what we are really trying to do is to remove the constraints of geography so scientists can collaborate widely. They can share data anywhere. They can access the fastest supercomputers no matter how far they are and they can engage the brightest minds. And we build cyber infrastructure 
with the express goal of accelerating scientific discovery. And that's the vision that drives us. Now, science, like I've heard lots of examples, but I'll give you a few and repeat some of them. The Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's largest instrument, is built in Geneva. And the collisions that happen in that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson and the 2012 Nobel Prize. Over the past decade, this instrument alone has generated 280 petabytes of data from 40 quadrillion collisions. And uh, I had to look up what quadrillion was. It's a million billion or a thousand trillion, so that many collisions. And this is over the last decade. Since 2014, ESNet has been exclusive network that carries this data transatlantically from this instrument to physicists at US national laboratories, Fermi National Lab, Brookhaven National Lab, and physicists around the country. But this is not just about US physicists. They collaborate globally to analyze this data and get the insights that we have. Now, this instrument is going through upgrades, so this doesn't stay static. And in 2019, the amount of data produced by this in instrument is gonna go 10X. And those are the kind of things that ESNet 6 was targeting or thinking about uh, when being built. Now, it's not only about the large instruments, it's about the sensors that you heard about, the sensors that measure the environment, the sensors that produce data that allow us or the scientists to reason about the pressing societal challenges today. You heard about the Earth System Grid Federation, the data that is accessed worldwide and it informs leaders, world leaders on what climate change policy should be. These sensors collect data, but they have to be shared widely because you want other people to be able to verify your models, to access data, data and do their own insights. So you see this graph in front is from the ARM user facility where the users are worldwide and they uh, download these data sets to do their own work. Now, this data flows internationally and nationally through collaboration. It's not just ESN, it's collaboration with regional networks, national networks, worldwide networks, some of them who are in the audience here today and virtually. So it's a collaboration itself in networking that enables this to happen. But, and you know, networking is 24 by seven. In the night, these optical telescopes are scouring the sky, looking for transient phenomena. Not just optical telescopes, but radio telescopes are looking for echoes left after the Big Bang to understand how the universe was formed, where, where, how it is evolving, and what the future holds for us. So that understanding comes from all uh, the data collected from these telescopes. The supernova is a gen of a generation was uh, discovered by a Berkeley Lab scientist. And that came from real-time analysis, near real-time analysis of data streaming from the Polar Observatory. We are currently collaborating very closely with the Vera Rubin project and with multiple networking organizations in South America and US to transfer the data from this telescope that is being uh, built in Chile to Slack for analysis. And in a couple of years, this should be ready to go as well. Now, ESNet is not only about exotic instruments or sensors. It connects all the DOE national labs. There are 70, more than 70,000 national employees. And these national labs have researchers that are working on the nation's priorities of basic science and energy security. So all the research uh, in, at those national labs uses the network. You have heard mentioned many times today from Dr. Berry, from Carol, on DOE being one of 28 Office of Science user facilities. What we are is a data circulatory system for those 27 other DOE Office of Science facilities. And that's what we hold dear when we think of the network and when we plan on what services we should build. Now, we have been collecting statistics on the data flowing through the network since 1990. Uh, Winsor mentioned we've been around for 35 plus years. Uh, and this data shows us that traffic has been growing exponentially 60% year on year. 
Uh, this traffic had a minor blip in 2020 due to the pandemic when the labs and some scientific facilities were shut down, but the growth has resumed its normal course. For the past 12 months, we moved around 1.4 exabytes of data. One thing interesting to no notice since 1990, it took us 28 years to reach one exabyte of data per year, which was in 2018. That's when we hit that mark. And in a couple of years, we expect to be doing two exabytes of data per year. So that's how exponential growth works. Uh, and I want to say, this was one of the biggest drivers that drove uh, the mission needs document that we wrote in 2016 to start the project off. I'm gonna give you a little bit history uh, of ESNet, repeat some of the things that Windsurf said. ESNet was formed as a combination of MFENet, Magnet Magnetic Fusion Energy Network, and HEPNet, High Energy Physics Network. Uh, this was uh, formed in 18, 1986. And at that time, we focused on the internet protocols as an organization, uh, helped deploy them, make them stable. Uh, and the internet was commercialized in the mid 90s. And all the work that was done by ARPANET, NSFNet, and many other people here who were around that time to help make internet the way it is, a stable uh, and growing uh, internet that has supported so much economy and growth and functions that you see today. But then since then, ESN has been upgrading the network and tackling this growing exponential growth of traffic, but pushing the boundary of the network with each upgrade. ESNet 6 does the same. And I'm here to talk about some of the innovations and how we have pushed the boundary in ESNet 6. Before I talk about uh, the network, I wanna talk about the goals. There were three simple but ambitious goals that we started out with. The first one I think you have heard about uh, a lot of times today, it is about managing exponential data growth. Now, we wanted to build an architecture where we could cost effectively grow the bandwidth as the data increased. And, and I think that's what we focused on. The second one is as real-time traffic, streaming traffic from instruments or supercomputers happen, we wanted to make sure we increase the resiliency and reliability of the network. You cannot afford to lose data uh, if you're doing an experiment and have to do the experiment again. These are expensive user facilities and expensive instruments. But we also knew with the advent of AI and ML and quantum information science, that the way science would happen, the way scientists would build things like instruments, like uh, Dr. Foster talked about, the smart instruments, are gonna change. And we want the network to be able to be flexible to adapt to the change, to be able to build custom things and custom services that scientists need. And so we had to build an architecture that would uh, build flexibility because we couldn't truly predict what the future has in store for us, but we wanted to be able to adapt to it and serve those needs. So let me talk uh, about uh, what we built. So from a bandwidth capacity perspective, we worked with our partners who are here, uh, Lumen, Sienna, Infinera, Nokia, to build and light up 15,000 miles of fiber across the US with 300 locations where ESNet equipment has been put around the, around, around the country and to offer 46 terabits of aggregate capacity. Now, this is the capacity as of today, but we have built capabilities and uh, to advance and add to this infrastructure as the data increases. Labs now can get from 400 gigabits per second to a terabits per second of capacity at their door, depending on their need. So this kind of took care of goal number one. For the other two goals, I wanna to talk to you about the architecture and what our ESNet architecture is about. But rather than give you a lot of technical uh, uh, details, I'm gonna give you an analogy and I hope that works for you. So we went with this network design from an Amtrak model where you stop at every town and onboard and offboard customers, or in our case data, to what we call an airline model. So we can go from any instrument to a lab with preferred nonstop, or maybe at most one to two stops. So that's what the model is. And that's what we call the hollow core network. 
because we don't try to stop all the way in the middle. Now, extending that analogy further, the smart services edge becomes like the first class lounge where you can get custom services to make your data what you need. So if a scientist wants a certain kind of performance, low latency, or they want some reserved bandwidth, or they want to move data at certain rates, they can get that. Do they want optical channels versus IP-based channels? They can get that. That customization was built in the smart services layer. The monitoring and the measurement made sure that none of the data would get weather delays, which is we monitor the performance of the network, performance of the flows to make sure that we can do the best performance we can out of the system. And the orchestration and automation using that same analogy helped us deploy new planes on demand or uh, new, uh, create new nonstop routes as and when needed. So that is the design I think that Wint mentioned was a unique design that will help hold us well for the future. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, this measurement and uh, monitoring capability. With collaboration with AMD, and thank you Gordon for being here, uh, we built a system that can look at every element of the packet that goes through the network, ingress, egress. That capability is not really available in commercial products or commercial networks today that, is, that we know of. Uh, in most of the networks, we sample things. So we look at one is, is to a thousand, and I won't try to extend the airline analogy with TSA here, so please uh, give that away. But in, in this network, we can truly, if you want to look at every packet that flows through the network and get information and data of it. What we hope to build is more proactivity. So rather than you picking up the phone, uh, like you do at home and calling Comcast and saying, my network is not working, we want to be able to proactively understand performance problems. It will help with cybersecurity and other applications that we have thought about and yet to implement. Now, let me talk a little bit about the orchestration and automation capability. In, in traditional networks, what happens is we log into each device, there is a nice interface, and you know, there is automation, but we use cut and paste or human designed configuration into the systems. When we started this project, we had a goal of changing how we operate and manage this network. So what we wanted to do was to give engineers an ability to do and spend a lot of time on planning upfront. So the engineer sits down, plans what they want the network to look like, designs what the intent is, what the service should be. And once that design is complete and vetted and, and, and uh, uh, finalized, it's a matter of a push button so that an orchestrator takes that intended service and instantiates it within the network by talking to the various devices, converting it into the configuration elements of their choice. This investment, we believe, will help with the integrated research infrastructure, what Dr. Foster talked about in terms of smart instruments where an AI can automatically control an instrument far away. That is the power of this platform. And I want to show a little demonstration of that uh, to you. Uh, this is going to be a live demonstration today. And I know all live demonstrations have got uh, some risk, but we, we decided to go with the risk today. We are all among friends here. So what I want to show you is, is this tool, what you call the policy-based routing tool. This has been built on top of this orchestration platform, and it's one of the many tools that you have. And what this tool is, we add new circuits or we add, you know, have errors. You want to be able to test the network. So we built a uh, tool for that. But for purposes of this meeting, we're going to uh, have an engineer configure three paths. Now, this topology is automatically generated. You can see it gets all the bytes uh, on counters automatically from the network. And the engineer is selecting three paths to do three by 100 gigabits transfer cross country. Uh, once the paths are selected, all they hit is a commit button and that automatically configures the paths, configures the traffic generators and gets the traffic going. And this is something that we, we wouldn't do hand selection in many cases. In many cases, we just select this link needs to get tested and it computes the paths and sets up the testers 
and does all the configuration automatically. But because we didn't want to bring the production uh, network down, it was an ES10.6 unveiling event. We wanted to make sure we chose the right paths so that we could saturate it without causing any issues on the production traffic. So can we go to the live uh, view? Okay, so this is our platform. It's called Stardust. It's our real-time monitoring platform. You can see traffic starting at the edge uh, as uh, this uh, commit was made and the network got configured. Uh, the links are gonna turn blue as traffic reaches uh, uh, 100 gigabits per second. And you can see that happening. Now, this tool is built on our telemetry platform. Each of the elements in the network is giving us telemetry that is actually streamed to a Google Cloud where it is analyzed and then visualized. And that visualization is what you see. This is something that the engineers use. We use with our uh, partners. There was a big LSC data challenge and the physics uh, folks were using this to see how the traffic was going, what flows are going over our network. And this is kind of a real-time platform that we have built within ESnet as well. As you can see, the traffic is going up. It is now uh, at 200 gigabits per second. Uh, and in, in little time, it will reach uh, 300 gigabits per second. You can see it coming up at 300 gigabits per second. And the lights are like, uh, lighting up. What you have to realize that this is amazing. In a few minutes, we were able to configure paths across the country while I was standing here, was able to get the traffic started and do a 300 gigabits per second flow that moved around three terabytes of data while we were just chatting here. And this is a capability of ESnet 6, and we want to be able to move petabytes of data and hundreds of petabytes of data at a push of a button. And that's what our goal is. I'm gonna go move on to the slides. I really want to thank the engineers because uh, uh, they 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 this worked well and the switching happened but also we had a whole backup plan so if this didn't work there was there's a recorded video that you can see showing this happen so amazing so lo and behold i give you esnet 6 I think as Ben mentioned, this is not just about technology, it's about people. And I really, really am thankful to the people that made this happen. Uh, they're all here uh, sitting with you. Four thirteen dot three processes. <laughs> But this was the first time for the facility uh, to do that. And it was a steep learning curve. It was not easy. I remember uh, how we all felt after the first director's review. But the team learned, they tackled this, they embraced this, and they made sure we use this process to get done, uh, the project completed ahead of time and under budget. And that is just amazing effort by the team. It was the first greenfield build of a network. We hadn't built the network from scratch and integrated it ever before. We used to get services from carriers and, and build some of it ourselves. Uh, it was the first time we built completely the optical layer and, and integrated that. When we started, we didn't have all the people to build this network. So we were hiring, integrating, and building the team and we grew the team more than 50% while we were executing the project. And then we had a surprise, the pandemic, right? And that increased the coordination 10X. I mean, we had to go to the national labs, to different sites. During this whole time that we implemented the whole optical network, actually during pre-vaccine pandemic period, there was not a single recorded direct transmission due to this installation. And that was the amazing work done by this team. And we had to do all of this while making sure none of the labs really felt that we were upgrading the network. They wouldn't even know that we had, during the project, 
taken elements of ESNet 6 and moved it into service. And we did that constantly throughout the project. It was not build and then switch. It was building pieces of it, making sure it's stable, moving it into production, moving, tackling the next piece. And that's how we built that engine while it was flying, as Windsurf mentioned. Now, this amazing feat is what I want, I'm here to celebrate. This amazing feat is why ESNet folks are here among us. And I re really am appreciate and I'm humbled that all of you flew in and came here to watch us celebrate this event. And this is the people of ESNet that all worked on this project. And I would like to... And while I'm humbled by the mission orientation of all of ESNet staff, I do want to call out two folks that actually led this project, uh, Kate Mace and Patty Gentile as project directors. And I want you to raise your hands. I won't ask you to stand up. <laughs> I also want to thank all the people who supported this journey. And there are too many people to name, and I'm sure I'm going to miss someone. So I, I, I apologize in advance. I want to personally thank the ESNet program managers of DOE who supported us, who trusted us and believed in the vision. And it was Vince Tutoria uh, who started out with the mission need. Dr. Ben Brown and Dr. Carol Hawk, who's online virtually today. They have been amazing supporters. And not only that, Rick Chapman from the DOE Berkeley site office was a stalwart believer in the team and what we were doing. I want to thank the lab leadership. Without their support, this would not have happened. I think we talked about finance and procurement and all of these uh, important issues that needed to be tackled and during the pandemic as well. So I would like to thank Dr. Mike Vidra, uh, Deputy Director Carol Burns, Deputy Director Michael Brandt, Dr. Ho Simon, who's uh, not here physically with us, Dr. Kathy Alex, she was, her support was amazing, Dr. Carter. The lab project management office, the finance team, the project uh, management team, all of them. But you know, the project had mentors as well. So it was not just us, the DOE and the lab. We had a lot of reviewers who spent their time and energy to help us, to help us figure out what we were missing, what we were not seeing. And some of them are here in the audience today, Sandy Marola, uh, Phil DeMar, Eric Lancon, I think he's here as well, and Amber, thank you. Thank you for giving us your insights and expert advice that helped us be better and helped us uh, be successful. This kind of mission orientation and careers of mission orientation is very hard to find. So I truly, truly thank all of you from the bottom of my heart, all the ESN staff here. Can you please raise your hands so others can see who the ESN staff are, please. This is truly a celebration about you and your accomplishments. With that, I would like to thank you.